If you've been studying for your Part 107 remote pilot test, I'm sure you've seen a lot of information on the internet. You've taken a number of practice tests and you're wondering, am I missing anything in my studies? Do I have all of the information that I need to go into that test and pass it? And that's what I want to address here in this video with the 10 most missed questions from my FAA Part 107 practice test. Now, this test contains over 300 questions, half of which are all of the publicly available questions from the FAA test bank, and about the other half I've written myself based on my 15 years of flight instructor experience and the nearly dozen or so FAA tests that I've taken for all of those different ratings. Now, this test will be linked in the video description if you want to take it. Like I said, it's over 300 questions. Every time you take it, you're presented with a new set of 60 questions, and you can get 20% off of that test with the code TUBE20. There is also a free version available that's just one set of 60 questions that you can still take to assess your readiness. Now, what I've done is I've taken the last about 400 students that have taken the full 300 uh, question test, and I've identified the 10 most missed questions. So we're gonna go over all of those 10 questions here, and hopefully uh, it can answer that question that you might have of, have I studied everything that I need? And if you're still unsure, like I said, you can go ahead and take those tests linked here. So let's start with the most missed question from that Part 107 remote pilot practice test. This question asks, refer to figure 21, area one, what is the approximate ceiling or the top of Minot International Class D airspace above ground level? Well, if we go to area one on this chart, we see that Minot Class D airspace, the dashed blue line, and we see that number in the brackets, 42. That means that the ceiling of that Class D airspace is 4,200 feet MSL, that's above sea level. But that's not what the question is asking. The question is asking above ground level. So that 4,200 feet above sea level would be also 4,200 feet above ground level if Minot International were at sea level. But it's not. Minot International is actually well above sea level. So what we need to do is subtract that 4,200 feet MSL from the MSL elevation of Minot to get that AGL answer for the height of that Class D airspace. So how do we find what that elevation of Minot International is? Well, if you go to that airport information block, you see a number in italics, and that italics indicate elevations. So here we see 1,716. That is the MSL elevation of Minot. So all we need to do is subtract that from 4,200 feet, and we get 2,484. That is the AGL ceiling of Minot Class D airspace. Answer B would be incorrect because like I said, that would only be valid if Minot were at sea level, but it's not, it's higher than sea level. And then answer C is incorrect because it's impossible even in the Dead Sea or Death Valley for the top of that airspace to be well over 6,000 feet above ground level when it's only 4,200 feet above sea level. Now let's go on to the second most missed question, which is a question that I wrote that's important to understand about aerodynamics and how stalls happen. And you will see a number of questions on the test about stalls. And so this question asks, does air density change the angle of attack where an airfoil will stall? Yes, no, or only in rotor-driven aircraft. The angle of attack at which an airfoil will stall, and when I say airfoil, I'm referring to the cross-section of whatever is creating lift. The angle of attack where that airfoil will stall is called the critical angle of attack. If we look at this graph here, you can see the critical angle of attack is at about 16 degrees. And then the lift starts to drop off after about 17 or 18 degrees. That stall starts to happen at 16 degrees angle of attack. 
It doesn't matter what is in the air or how dense or how humid or how high that air is. That airfoil will always start to stall at 16 degrees angle of attack. So the air density doesn't change that number. Now you may get to that 16 degrees angle of attack at different regimes of flight, maybe at lower air speeds or higher air speeds, depending on the air density, but it's always going to happen at 16 degrees. And so the answer here is no. Air density does not change when an airfoil will start to stall. Question number three, another airspace question that I wrote myself. This one asks, the Class E airspace over Napa County starts at, and you can see your options here are 2,500 feet MSL or AGL or 2,501 feet MSL. There's a little one foot difference there. So we find the Napa County Class D airspace, and like that first question, we see in the brackets 2,500 feet. That is the top of the Napa County Class D airspace, 2,500 feet MSL above sea level. There is always going to be Class E airspace above Class D delta airspace, and that starts right above it. So if the Class D airspace, the top of that is 2,500 feet MSL, and the Class E starts right above it at 2,501 feet MSL. And this is a good example of just taking your time to read the full question, okay, RTFQ. Read the freaking question. Those are one of my uh, five FAA test taking tips, and I did another video about that that you can watch that I'll link here. But read the question carefully, because what happens is you go to the chart, you see that 25 in the brackets, and you immediately think 2,500 feet. That's the answer. But that's not what the question is asking. So make sure you take the time to understand exactly what the question is asking before you go to the answers. Question number four. This is one of my favorites because of all the hate mail I get when people take this test and they get this one wrong and then they write in that my answers are incorrect and that I've done a poor job of constructing this test because I have incorrect answers in here. This question asks, if you change your mailing address, you must update your SUAS registration information within either seven days, 14 days, or 30 days. Everyone has been answering 30 days, and that is incorrect. You will get that one marked wrong. Just like the last question, take your time to read the effing question. Make sure you know what the question is asking. There's that keyword in there, registration information. Again, everyone always sees this question and says, oh, change my mailing address. I have 30 days to do that. That is only valid for your pilot certificate. Your pilot certificate is completely different from your aircraft registration. That aircraft registration needs to be updated within 14 days. Your pilot certificate, 30 days. I know it's really stupid. I don't understand why they did this. It'd be like the DMV requiring you to update your driver's license within 30 days of moving, but you have to update your car registration within 14 days. It's kind of dumb, but that is a question that will get you on the test. Make sure you take your time to read the question and understand this is asking about registration, not certification. Question number five, the fifth most missed question has to do with accident reporting. Your drone crashes into a backyard and damages furniture. Repair would cost $650. Replacement would cost $500. Does this need to be reported? Yes, no, or only on the request of the property owner. Remember that property damage only needs to be reported if both the repair cost and the replacement cost would exceed, would be more than $500. In this case, since it can be replaced for exactly 500 and not 501, it's not over 500, it's just 500, then this accident does not need to be reported. If that repair would cost $650 and the replacement would cost 501, then yes, it would need to be reported, but this question 
does not exceed, it's not more than $500. Number six has to do with waivers. You want to fly in the middle of the night without an anti-collision beacon for a job. Is it possible to get a waiver for this? Yes, no, or only in class G, uncontrolled airspace. Having an anti-collision beacon is a requirement for flying at night. However, a lot of these operational requirements can get waived by the FAA. There is an entire waiver process. I'll link to that process in the video description here. But as long as you can show the FAA that you have a risk management plan and you have an operational necessity to operate without a beacon or exceed the speed limit or something like that, then they can issue a waiver for those operational requirements, allowing you to fly outside of those rules that the waiver uh, is for. And that link that I'll have in the description, and not only shows you the whole request for that waiver process, but it shows you which operational rules can be waived. Number seven, another chart reading question. When you see an asterisk or a star in the airport information block, it means that you'll find amplifying information in the margins of the VFR sectional chart, the chart supplements US booklet, or the notums. A star or an asterisk, as we see here, means that you need to look up supplemental information to get the whole picture for that airport. And that information can't fit on these already crowded charts. It can't fit here on the actual map itself, and it can't fit in the margins of the sectional. There's just not enough room. So you need to look up that supplemental information in the chart supplements booklet. That booklet has a lot of information about every airport in the US, including the airport layout, the fuel that that airport has, operating hours, any other kind of special procedures. And so like in this example here, it means that there is more additional information that you need to look up in that chart supplements booklet. Question number eight, another registration question. SUAS registration must be renewed every year, every two years, or every three years. Everyone has been answering two years for this question. It's very similar to that one about changing your mailing address. You have different time frames for your pilot certificate and for your drone registration. This is much of the same. You know that you have two years, that it's actually 24 calendar months to renew your pilot certificate, but your drone registration doesn't need to be renewed for three years. So again, carefully read the question, understand what the question is asking, registration is renewed every three years. Question number nine, another chart question. Refer to figure 21, you've been hired by a farmer to use your small unmanned aircraft to inspect his crops. The area that you are to survey is in the Devil's Lake West MOA, military operating area, east of area two. How would you find out if this MOA is active? Would you refer to the chart legend, find the information in the small UAS database, or refer to the military operations directory. Now you've most likely heard of the margins of the chart when you've been studying. That's the same as the chart legend. A lot of the information about that chart is in the margins or the legend. And actually for this question, options number B and C aren't really things, they don't really exist. So through process of elimination um, and just knowing that the legend and the margins are kind of the same thing, we know that the best answer here is A in the chart legend. So that'll show you when that MOA is active, uh, the dates and the times, who controls that MOA, and uh, how to contact them, at least on the radio. And finally, question number 10. This one has to do with the rules for operating over people. Now, I've actually been quite surprised um, in these practice tests, people have been doing great. All the test takers have been doing really well on the remote ID questions and the operations over people questions. Now, this question has been tripping up uh, a number of people and it has to do with variable configurations. If your drone is um, certified, has a declaration of compliance to fly in one of the four operational categories or is even certified for more than one of the operational categories. So it asks, if your UA is capable of operating within one of the four operational categories or variable modes, 
Are you allowed to switch modes in flight? Yes, no, or only in Class E airspace. According to FAR Part 107.150, you can only switch between categories, so either enabling or disabling one of the categories, switching between one of the categories, through direct intervention via hardware or software configurations. What this means is that your aircraft cannot be capable of accidentally switching from Category 3 to Category 2 in flight. And a lot of people have been asking, how is that even possible? How could you possibly switch from a Category 3 to a Category 2 or a Category 2 to nothing? And this all has to do with the equipment required to operate in those categories. So for example, Category 3 does not require remote ID. Category 2 does. Some of these categories may also require uh, an emergency parachute. If the batteries failed or the aircraft has some kind of problem, a parachute would deploy so that it doesn't fall on anyone and cause some kind of serious injury. Those systems can only be disabled through direct intervention from you. You have to be able to intentionally switch um, or change those settings through some kind of direct intervention. So it's not accidentally happening in flight. So those are the 10 most missed questions from my FAA Part 107 practice test. You'll find the links to those tests in the video description. Again, don't forget to use that code TUBE20 for 20% off. That discount also applies to the full FAA Part 107 Remote Pilot Test Prep course. If you want to go through the full course just to get a good understanding of all of the information that's on that test, you'll also find that linked in the description. If you have any other questions about the topics that we have discussed in this video, please leave them in the comments. Happy studying, and I know you'll do great on your test.